Good morning. Welcome to Line Lexington Mennonite Church. We'll begin our singing this morning by turning in your green hymnals to number 145. 145. And we'll stand to sing the first two hymns this morning. 145. There's a wideness in God's mercy. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner, and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior, there is healing in His blood. But we make God's love too narrow by false limits of our own. And we magnify His strictness with all zeal God will not I suggest you use the book on this one. We haven't sung this a lot. And it'll help you know where you're going. Ah, ah, ah. 
Today are all kind of on God's mercy and his pardon. Uh, Jim will be preaching on the um, prodigal son. So if you think of all those uh, terms, love, mercy, pardon, weaving through these songs, uh, just like the prodigal son came back to his father, we come back to our father. Um, so let's uh, sing this next song here. Spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied. have the ladies, just the ladies sing the second verse, and just the men sing the third verse. The other two verses will all sing together. Thank you. 
to raptures above. Upward for and on wings like a dove. Jesus, I come to thee. Everyone. Love above fear and dread of the truth. Jesus, I Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our worship service here this morning at Lyon Lexington Mennonite Church and extra special welcome to any visitors we have this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements that I'll share first. Um, there will be a soup and salad fellowship meal today. You're all invited to uh, stay for that. Whether you brought a meal or not, that's fine. Um, and uh, I guess there's going to be an Eagles game later this afternoon. So. Don't worry about it. We'll be, we'll be fine. You'll get done in time. So uh, stay for that if you can. Um, next Sunday is an important Sunday at Line Lexington. Uh, there will be a congregational survey uh, taken um, uh, during our worship service next week. Uh, this is part of the pastoral search process. Uh, so on uh, between page five and six, I think it is, there is a insert in your bulletin, as there was last week as well, um, telling you and explaining to you more about that survey. And please, 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 if you are not going to be here next week, January 28th, um, contact the church and pick up a copy of that survey um, so that you can uh, make other arrangements to, to fill that in. Um, on February 4th, uh, we're going to add an additional Sunday school class uh, to the one that we have up here. There's going to be a women's class starting. Uh, I believe it's going to be downstairs. And uh, on page two, there is more information about that in your bulletin. And uh, talk to uh, Mary Long, Meredith Long, um, if you want more information about that. She um, is kind of going to be the facilitator for that uh, women's Sunday school class. Uh, next week on January 27th, um, we're going to have the memorial service for, um, uh, for Glenn Rush. Um, I believe this, the visitation time is at 10 o'clock, and the memorial service will begin at um, 11. So uh, come to that if you're able next Saturday. Um, I'm sure Cindy would appreciate that. Um, an announcement from Gary, um, we uh, over, I guess, when Gary took his sabbatical last summer, uh, one of the things that when, when he came back and shared with us um, about what he did during his sabbatical, and, and as part of that was youth ministry stuff, but a bigger piece of that was his role as uh, minister of pastoral care. And um, we just want to remind everybody um, to use Gary's gifts as a, as a person who interacts very well with all generations. 
So if you have pastoral uh, care concerns, if there's someone you love or um, there's someone in need, give Gary a call. Um, he would very much appreciate that. And um, he passes that on then to the de uh, deacons and, and deaconesses. So um, that's something that um, Gary is very good at, and we would appreciate if you, you kind of do that. Um, this week, uh, as you noticed on the screen behind me, um, there, this is Sanctity of Life Sunday. I believe that was started by um, President Reagan way back when. Um, and I think there's a video that, from the uh, pregnancy um, uh, clinic, uh, the resource clinic of North Penn. Do I, am I right? Do we have a video for that? Okay. Our mission here at the Pregnancy Resource Clinic is to help young women and men who find themselves in a crisis pregnancy. They're really struggling and they don't know where to go and there's a lot of fear involved. And so we're here to help them with that so that they can learn to know that there's so much out there to help them. God's grace is amazing and he's given it to me and so therefore we are here to show others that God's grace is for them as well. The goals of the clinic are to be a place that is known in the community and in the surrounding areas as a safe place to get accurate information that women need when making decisions about their pregnancies. When I saw the baby's heartbeat, it really made me feel happy and continue and seeing Sharon to talk about it. As I kept coming back, I just felt more comfortable even after the pregnancy and it's like kind of a safe haven. Life with my two sons are crazy, but I love them and want to train them for the world. It was a godsend. When I actually walked in and I saw a smiling face and I saw Lee and she said when she saw my ultrasound, oh, you're having two, congratulations. These people aren't here to judge you. They're here to help you. A certain somebody was putting it in my ear that, you know, I'm not ready for this. I can't do this. I'm not ready for this. I can't do this. And I was like, you just need to mute it because I'm hearing you, but I'm not hearing myself tell myself what I want to do. I just remember them telling me, like, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And I did it. And nobody should go through it alone. No, I mean, and it's, it's very helpful. And I, I had no idea places like this even existed. Some of the things we offer here are pregnancy testing. We do health assessments. We do STI, which is sexually transmitted infection testing, and ultrasounds. There are very few places like this where someone can come and get the level of service, love, kindness, supplies, um, life skills, spiritual guidance. Generally, they're here because the tension in their relationship has reached a high stress level, and they're looking for some kind of guidance, some kind of hope. My mom came here 24 years ago when she was pregnant with me. She had nowhere to go, but she was pregnant and scared and didn't know what her options were, and she just knew she wanted to keep me, but didn't know how she could possibly do that. What this place did was gave her the option to choose life, and it came around full circle when I had her. I talked to Lee Patkins, and she helped me um, in the delivery room. She saw me be born, and then she saw my daughter be born. <laughs> Mainly, I just owe my life to this place. Calvary Church supports the clinic because we believe it's the best way to help people who are facing unwanted pregnancies. We know when the people go there, they're going to get wise counsel and be given biblical options on what to do with the child they're carrying. Well, every Sunday I come here and I see people that are alive, young children, teenagers, because of the work of the clinic. And to me, that's the primary reason why we do it. We want to reach girls at the moment of their decision-making process. When they're fearful, they're scared, they don't know where they're going to go or what they're going to do, they need help. And fear kind of makes us do things we never thought we would. But when they come here, they feel like cared about, listened to, and that fear starts melting away when they see that there's help available to them. When I meet a client who I've been working with for months and months during her pregnancy and she comes in with her new little baby, uh, there is just nothing like that. To know that God allowed me to be part of their story and God allows you to be part of their story because you financially support us, 
There's nothing like that. You know, it's a gift. It's a beautiful thing to behold. I remember a number of years ago, um, Dr. Scott Melanson from St. Luke's Hospital, I believe, came and talked with many of our young people here um, about the, I think it had a different name then, but it's the Pregnancy Resource Clinic, and I remember him sharing quite a bit with our youth group here at church. Uh, I don't know if that's ongoing anymore, but um, something to keep in mind, not just on on uh, this day, uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday, but every day. So, um, <clears throat> I guess this uh, brings us to our prayer time. Uh, just a couple on our list, in addition to those that are in your bulletin. Um, we want to continue to pray for Cindy, of course, as uh, she mourns the loss of Glenn um, and uh, the whole Rush family as well. And Arlene shared with me this morning that John's going to have a busy week this week with uh, rehabilitation and uh, physical therapy. Uh, so we want to, um, John, if you're watching us this morning and worshiping with us at home, we want to pray for you this morning as well. And uh, Gary um, and many of the youth and uh, some resource people are up at Hemlock Springs this weekend, so we want to remember them as well. So if you uh, pray with me. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for um, this opportunity to gather in your name uh, here at Line Lexington Mennonite Church. Uh, Father, we are gathered um, here not only to uh, worship you, but also to celebrate the gift of life. Uh, this is the greatest gift that you have ever given us. Uh, you authored us into existence, and you alone, Lord, decide um, when that should end. Um, remind us frequently of, Lord, of that, Lord, and not just on this day. We do pray for those um, who uh, promote abortion. We pray that their hearts be um, uh, tempered and their eyes are opened to the gift that you have given us, the gift of life. Um, we pray um, for those uh, you know, who view life in, in different ways. Um, open all of our eyes to the fact that you uh, gave us the gift of your son, Jesus, uh, a precious gift um, to send him to us, to die for us, so that we may have eternal life. We don't take that for granted, Lord, and we pray that you continually remind us of that. We pray for the Rush family, especially Cindy, as she grieves the loss of her husband. We pray for um, the service next week that uh, you bring out those uh, the best of us um, so that we can come and worship and gather with her to uh, to share in the memories of Glenn. Um, we also pray for John this morning that you bring and continue to bring healing to his body and also those uh, of the rest of us that have recent surgeries um, that we've been talking about and, and listing in our bulletin for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we do and, and uh, know that you are with us in that healing process as the giver of life, but also the great healer. We pray for uh, the youth group, for Gary and for Dana and Alyssa, who are bringing the worship time and all the, the leaders and especially all of this, um, the, the youth that are, are at the retreat this weekend. We pray, Lord, that you bless them with the richness of your presence and may they experience you in a new way, in a different way. Uh, pray for a good time for each and every one of them so uh, they can enjoy uh, their time together away. We pray for Jim this morning as he brings the message to us. May the words that he shares with us uh, be your words. And may we have the ears to hear what he has to share. And now for the offering too, Lord, that um, we are about to lift. We pray that the gift is blessed and that the giver is blessed as well and that you use all the money and the resources for your, your kingdom work. In Jesus' name, amen.
I want to come home. Father, forgive me, wipe my tears away. Father, I've wronged you, but oh, how I have to pay. Let me be your servant, I'm not worthy. number 139. Again, I really advise you to use the book on this one. Yeah, this actually tells a story, the whole story of the prodigal son, and I was like fascinated by this, but it's not the most easy song to sing. It's in the minor key to begin with. So we're going to sing the first year verse in unison. Everybody sing the melody. Uh, we're going to take it kind of slow because it tells a story, uh, tells a whole story of the prodigal son. I'm going to play through the whole thing once. in unison. Far, far away from my loving father, I had been wandering wayward while fearing only lest his anger overtake his sin
be reading um, Luke 15, 11 through 32 in the NIV. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to be a citizen of that country. He went out to a citizen, let me start over. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robes, put on him, and, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill him. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when, his son, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because your brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Good morning. Let me try that again. Good morning. It's good to see you, too. It's good to be with you. It's been a joy for Robin and me to uh, actually uh, be visiting with you for a number of weeks, actually months now, and uh, you've made us feel quite welcome. We appreciate that. And I just want to tell you something else. Um, two weeks ago, Lowell was preaching on uh, a short series, and it was about... Um, dream and a, and a dream fulfilled or a dream delayed. He had said before the beginning of the sermon, there's going to be an opportunity, if you want to have prayer, to come forward for prayer. This was not part of our tradition at St. Peter's to any extent, uh, but as soon as he said that, I had an incredible twinge of my heart that I thought, I needed to go forward. Well, the sermon went on. I continued to sense that. And at the end of the sermon, Raman nudges me and says, Jim, I need to go forward. And I said, Raman, so do I. And we came here. We knelt at the bench. But I just want to let you know, um, i just give you a little insight into myself. And I think it's an insight that might be helpful for many of us as we look at transitions in our life. The reason I came forward said, God, exactly what is it you have for us in this next chapter? After our retirement, just a sense, trying to find what God's ministry is for us in this next chapter of our lives. And for me to come forward at that point 
was just a way of saying, Lord, I want to be available, and I want to seek your face to know what your will is. Do you sense in your life there are chapters, and you see in different chapters of our life, different, we call them seasons or whatever, and it, it was just, it's just a sense for me, since retiring this last summer, I thought I had a clear sense of what I was going to be about, but still trying to get into the rhythms and the faithful rhythms of life in this next chapter. So if you pray for me uh, and for Robin, as she continues to work full time, she will for another year and a half or so, she plans. Um, but as we just seek how to be faithful in these next stages of life, I'd appreciate it. I don't know if this is part of your tradition either, but I want to do something uh, with you uh, today. And um, what I'd like to do is ask if you could turn to the person next to you, or two people, three people, whatever you're comfortable with. I just have a couple of questions I want you to discuss can you just talk to a person next to you, or two or three, discuss a time you lost something? Go ahead. How about, talk about, did you ever find it, or talk about you f a time you found something that was lost. Can you talk about that? Go ahead. How many of you found the thing that you lost? Let's see a show of hands. How many of you lost something that's never been found? All right. Today we want to talk about that which is lost, that which is found. And we're going to be doing that based on uh, the parable that Jesus tells that we call the prodigal son. But actually I want to look at the context with you. And if you see the context of this parable, it's quite important that we notice that the entire chapter 15 of Luke is about lost things. But more importantly, the context, first of all, always notice this, especially in the teachings of Jesus, notice the audience to which he's speaking. This audience that Jesus is speaking to has two very distinct groups of people. Notice in the scripture it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Group one. But, there's a big contrast between the tax collectors and sinners, notorious sinners, who the righteous people knew that Jesus should have no business hanging around with those folks. If he had any sense at all who those people were, he would not be with them. But what does it say? But the Pharisees, religious group who were very uh, concerned about keeping every detail of the law, and teachers of the law muttered, this man does what? Welcomes sinners and eats with them. To a Pharisee, 
A Pharisee would make sure that they never affiliated with an outwardly sinful person, and especially they would never eat with such a person. To do so would be to defile them. And this is what it says then. Then, or therefore, because of the reaction of the Pharisees and keepers of the law, because of their muttering, Jesus told them this parable. Now it says this parable, so it makes one wonder if indeed three distinct parables, we have three distinct parables in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, but at one sense it's a, it's a continuation of a parable on lost things. Take a look. The first one is the lost sheep. And if you're looking in your scriptures, you'll notice it's uh, in chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. And it tells us this. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. And this is offensive even on the face. We don't get this. But do you realize the Pharisees look down at shepherds? Because shepherds could not keep the, the extremes of the law. You know, we romanticize the idea of a shepherd. And we think of the good shepherd. And we think of Psalm 23. But to the Pharisees, shepherds were looked down upon. And so Jesus is inviting these muttering people. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. And at first they're going to I can't imagine that. I'd never do that. That's beneath me. And loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. In the same way, Jesus says there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. In the second one, there's the parable of the lost coin. And again, Jesus says something that would be offensive to the Pharisees because women, I hate to say this about the Pharisees, but you know it well, they looked down on women. Women were not the equal of men. As a matter of fact, Pharisees had a prayer. Thank you, Lord, that I was not born a sinner, I was not born a Gentile, and I was not born a woman. They looked down at women. And in, con in that context, Jesus says, or suppose a woman. Suppose a woman, what, has ten silver coins and loses one of them. Imagine a house about 20 by 20 with the smallest of one single window. A dirt floor, maybe even twigs on the floor. Can you imagine losing a coin and trying to see it with just a very small oil lamp type candle? But there's another point. Some commentators say that these ten coins might represent the ten coins that a woman would have on a headdress that would be the equivalent in our culture of a wedding ring. And so it's not just the need of finding one lost coin, but the possibility that there was incredible sentimental value here. And so the woman looks diligently, searches hard in a dark space, and finds the one lost coin. And what does she do? Well, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Therefore, Luke 15 is all about being lost and then found, a sheep, a coin, and then a son. Or is it two sons? Jesus introduces the parable that we call the prodigal son. A man has two sons. We typically only focus on the one who went away. But some would say the name of this parable could be the parable of the older brother. 
Because who is Jesus talking to? What was the audience he's talking to? Muttering Pharisees? Today we want to look together at this parable of Jesus and ask these questions. Who is it that is lost? Who is it that is found? What does it mean to be lost? And how do these parables in Luke 15 relate to the two groups of people in the original audience Jesus was telling them to? Would you bow for a moment of prayer with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. If we go into this uh, lengthy parable, probably the best-known parable uh, in the New Testament, that or the Good Samaritan, we, we know the story well. What happens, first of all, is there is the interaction between the younger brother and the father. And we get introduced to the younger brother. And how many of you are the youngest sibling in your family? I, I see somebody put her hand up like this. The older siblings called you spoiled, right? Is that correct? The younger kid in the family is always called the spoiled one. And we'll get to what we call the older sibling in the family in a minute. But so this young son, and, and we have to look into this culture. This is a very shame-based culture, a very... Um, paternalistic culture, a, a culture where honor and deference are important. And the younger son comes and brashly says to his father, Yo, Pops, I want the money that I'm going to get after you die, but I don't want to wait that long. Give it to me now. And he gets it, and we know what happens. He spends his life in a distant country, and all that it may entail. And I know I have a late brother-in-law who, as a young child at a carnival or at the York County Fair, once said, a fool and his money are soon parted. <laughs> he was probably eight years old at the time. <laughs> but in that case, as in this case, it's what happened. There's a fascinating line in this parable. Four, four little words. The scripture says, he came to his senses. If you've ever done any work with the 12-step programs or known folks who have gone through 12-step programs, or known folks who have gone through recovery, one of the things that we often talk about is folks need to hit bottom. And one of the things that we sometimes do is ask, how can we raise the bottom so people can hit bottom so they might come to their senses? He had gone through all his money, gone through his resources. He's a Jewish boy feeding pigs. And as he prepares to feed the pigs, he says, you know what? This stuff looks pretty good. And it's right then that he comes to his senses, it says. And he starts to think about life back home, and he starts to think about life in the pigsty, and he says, how many of my father's servants have it so much better than me? And so he prepares his speech. And his speech is essentially, boy, did I mess up. I'm not worthy anymore to be called your son, but just take me on as one of your servants. It's all I'm worthy of. And you know what happens. He returns home, and I can imagine as Jesus is telling this story, I can imagine that the, the hearers would envision this young son rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing his speech that he's going to tell his father. He gets home, he starts the speech, and he's interrupted. And what happens? 
This is so critical, and, and again, I'd, I'd encourage you, um, if you've never read or listened to tapes by the late Kenneth Bailey, Kenneth Bailey, a linguist and a missionary who spent many, many years in the Middle East, gives great insight into the culture. He says, in that paternalistic honor and shame-driven culture, the reaction of the father would never have been what we see that Jesus tells us. The normal reaction of the father would be actually to slap his son because he has shamed the family. This is radical. The father won't let the son even get out his speech, but he does what? He embraces him. And every aspect of what he gives his son is symbolic. He first of all gives him a robe. His tattered clothes are replaced with a new and appropriate set of clothing. The second thing he gives him is a ring. You know that ring was not just a piece of jewelry? You know what the, that, that would actually be like in our culture? It was probably a signet ring that would be the equivalent of giving him the platinum visa card. Because now, with the signet ring, he could go ring up a debt on his father's account. This is not what he's expecting. The next thing he gives him are sandals. One of the signs of a slave is a slave was barefooted, but... He's not going to be a slave anymore. He's going to be a son. He has shoes on his feet. And then finally, as if this is not extreme enough, he says, we need to throw a party. Get the fatted calf. Kill the fatted calf. We must have a party. We absolutely have to have a party because his son of mine was dead and now he's alive. Call everybody. Let's have a party. But then, there's the older brother. How many of you are firstborns? We could do an entire study on this. I'm married to a firstborn sibling. And uh, Rob and I were each one of five. I was second in line. One of the things that we find most often about firstborn siblings, um, often they best reflect the um, characteristics and uh, mores, traditions of their family, uh, often uh, very driven. So here's this son, the firstborn, the older. He's out in the field working, and he hears something. That sounds like music. Where's that coming from? comes in out of the field, and what happens? Well, he asks someone. He came near the house. He heard the music and the dancing. He called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother's come home, he replied. Your father's killed a fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. What's the older brother's reaction? He becomes angry and refused to go in. I want you to see a commonality here. What did the father do with the younger son? Did the father wait until the younger son got there? No. He ran to greet him. What does the father do with this older brother? He goes out to call him. And again, in an honor and shame-based culture, look what the brother does. He answered his father. This is so disrespectful what he says. Look here, man. He's not saying, but father. He's saying, look here, man. All these years I've been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your orders. 
yet you never even gave me a young kid to celebrate with my friends. What's he called his brother? But when this son of yours, do you hear, do you hear the hiss in his voice? When this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, how did he know that? Do you know what's fascinating about what the older brother should have done in a family in that culture? The older brother should have been the one to go and search for his brother to try to help him come home. This son of yours squandered all your property with prostitutes. He comes home, you killed a fatted calf for him. The disrespect. The description of his life at home. How did he describe his life? I've been slaving here all these years. Wow. The younger son is a slave. He comes home and gets shoes. But here's the older brother with all the benefits of home. But he views his life as a slave. Not in freedom. And what's amazing? Again, the father's gracious reply. Gracious to the younger son, gracious to the older son. The father doesn't say, listen, you don't talk to me like that. He says, my son, my son, you've always been with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate because the brother of yours, your brother, which you're not acknowledging at this point, was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. So who's lost, who's found? You know, when we call this the parable of the prodigal son, we assume, oh, there's a lost son and he was a prodigal and he went far country and he came home and he was found. Klein Snodgrass, in his book, uh, Stories with Intent, Great tome, a wonderful, helpful guide to uh, all the parables of Jesus. It says, this parable should be called the parable of the compassionate father with two lost sons. And what I would commend to you, if you have not read the little book, The Prodigal God by Timothy Keller, it's incredible and incredibly helpful. And one of the things Keller helps us to see is that there are two ways of being lost, not just one way of being lost. If you think about that, think about the contrast of the original audience when we looked at this context. Who were the two groups of hearers? You had the sinners and the tax collectors. Who would they most re represent in the parable of the prodigal son? They'd represent the prodigal, the one who's been living in a far country, who are then in Jesus experience this gracious reception. But who would the Pharisees and, and meticulous keepers of the law represent? Which brother? They'd represent the older brother, the one who can stand outside and sneer in anger and not rejoice. Timothy Keller, as he helps us understand the idea of being lost in two different ways, also says that just like a computer has a default system, we as human beings have a default, and our default is toward religion. We talk about works versus grace, but there's a, there's, a, there's a way to think of religion versus grace. And I'm going to do it, and I'm going to illustrate by giving you kind of the way I'm going to show you with my body. Religion essentially approaches life as though it were a balance scale. And if you have good on this side and bad on that side... If I do enough 
good works here, it balances out the bad over there. And taken a step further, what it says essentially is that the way I find favor with God, the way I find acceptance by God, is by doing enough good, and maybe I'll make God love me. The ancients would have thought about placating the gods. But in religion, we are saying, I'll do that which is good so that God will love me. It's a balance of a scale. But in grace, we see the outstretched arms of a loving God shown to us in Christ Jesus, where Christ died on the cross. And we find that we love God because he first loved us. And that we are accepted by God, not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of accepting what God in Christ has done for us. And it's all grace. It's all free grace. It's all radical free grace. But this older sibling, the older son, is actually saying one of the first phrases of moral outrage any of our children ever speak. We've all heard it. We've all said it. When something doesn't seem right in the family, a child who sees it says, that's not, that's not fair. And this older brother saying, that's not fair. I stayed here and did everything I was supposed to do. He went away and squandered things. He gets the party. Where's that fair? Guess what? When we hear the moral outrage of the older sibling, when he says, it's not fair, you know what it's followed up by? A whole lot of first person singular pronouns. I, me, my. <laughs> because he's just thinking of himself. You know, the shame of it is the slavish, joyless obedience of the older brother has led to bitterness, unforgiveness, and most tragically, it led to a blindness to who his father is and always has been. He cannot see how he also is a beloved son to his father and to be a brother to his brother. I want you to consider, as we think of these two ways of being lost, I want you to think about three people who were great proponents and writers about grace. The first you're familiar with, I imagine, and it's referenced in the title and the, and the initial slide that we had when it says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. What hymn is that from? Amazing Grace. John Newton. John Newton, most of us know part of the story, but did you know that John Newton, who called himself a wretch, who said that he was lost and blind, left school at the age of 11 to answer the call of the sea? He got into all of the debauchery that would be involved in that at that time. He went on to become captain of a ship that was involved in the slave trade, going to West Africa taking captives and selling those slaves in other parts of the world. During one particularly tumultuous night at sea and day at sea as the storm raged, he turned to a book by Thomas Akempis, The Imitation of Christ. And as he read that, he came to true faith and was converted. At the age of 39, he was actually ordained as an Anglican priest, and served in a small church outside Cambridge, England. He helped to write a number of hymns and put together a hymnal. And one of those hymns was Amazing Grace. John Newton would be the typical, prototypical prodigal. He went away, he lived in rebellion, and he came to true faith. But you know about Martin Luther? 
Martin Luther, who wrote so much about grace and the Protestant Reformation, Philip Yancey, in a great book entitled, What's So Amazing About Grace, says this, For those who do not rebel, but rather strive sincerely to keep the rules, legalism sets another trap. The feelings of failure may cause long-lasting scars of shame. As a young monk, Martin Luther would spend as long as six hours racking his brain to think of sins he might have committed the previous day. Luther wrote this, Although I lived a blameless life as a monk, I, th I felt that I was an, a sinner with an uneasy conscience before God. I also could not believe that I had pleased him with my works. Far from loving that righteous God who punished sinners, I actually loathed God. I was a good monk and kept my order so strictly that if ever there was a monk who could get to heaven by monastic discipline, I was that monk and all of my companions in the monastery would confirm this. And yet my conscience would not give me certainty. But I always doubted and said, you didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. You weren't contrite enough. You left that out of your confession. And if we go back to the biblical time, we think of the Apostle Paul, who before he was the Apostle Paul, was Saul of Tarsus. Paul could say this of himself in Philippians chapter 3. He spoke about, as he's telling the people about the wonders of grace, he says this. Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 through 11. Though I myself have reason for such confidence in the flesh, if others think they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I all the more, circumcised in the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as of zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, having a righteousness not of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God based on faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so now, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So, again, we see these two ways of being lost and of being found. But when we see this being lost and being found, I think the important focus is to consider the characteristics of the Father. What do we determine, what can we determine about the Father and his characteristics from this parable? First thing I hope to see is this Father is very compassionate to which of the sons? To both of them. Absolutely right, to both. The other thing we would see, this Father is incredible in his acceptance. He openly accepts the younger son and he wholeheartedly invites the older son. Please join in. He also is a, is a father who desires to see full restoration of the lost son. And he's a father who is able to rejoice. I don't know about you folks, but I'll tell you what, are there certain places that you go you feel out of place? I went to a hip-hop concert yesterday. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I would feel out of place there. <laughs> but let me tell you, you know, 
Weddings are all great and wonderful and fine and good and stuff, but if I go to a wedding reception where it's really celebrative and it gets a little raucous, I feel like I'm kind of like the Pharisee at a party that Jesus was. I just, uh, this is not, I am not so, uh, I'm just not real comfortable there. It's not my, uh, not my place. Can we believe in a rejoicing God? Can we believe in a God that actually rejoices and that angels would dance and sing and celebrate when somebody comes to Christ? But there's another thing in each of these three parables that gives us an indication of our Father's character. The diligent searcher. What does the shepherd do? He leaves 99 and diligently searches till he finds the one. What does the woman do? She lights a lamp and does everything she can until she finds the one coin that's missing. And what's the father do? He rejoices when that which is lost comes home. I don't know what Robin told about what she might have lost, but she might have told about recently losing her keys on our trip to Colorado. And I would just say, in Robin's defense, she had bought a, um, one of those uh, down vests, you know, and it had pockets on the inside of the vest. Months later, she realized, guess what? The one pocket was never sewn on the bottom. And when she went on the trip to Colorado, guess where she put her keys? So when she came home from Colorado, she didn't have any keys. I said, I'll help you try to find them. So I called the owner of the cabin where we stayed in Colorado. Marge, Robin lost her keys. I'll go over there right away. I'll search. I'll see if they're there. She called me back. I'm sorry. I also, I also checked up the street and uh, Cardinal's house. No, Cardinal doesn't have me there. I'm sorry. Well, then... Robin rode in a rental car. So I called the rental car company and the specific office in Denver and said, listen, um, this was rented in such a person's name, and my wife was there, and she lost her keys. Okay, we'll look. But then what I did is I called the airlines, except you couldn't call the airlines. You fill out a form online. And guess what they did, is they sent me this wonderful weekly update. We're sorry, we've done all we can, but we haven't found your item. Did I believe a thing that they said? No. I absolutely believed Marge. I even believed the woman at the uh, rental car company. But, you know, that concerned email that I got weekly until a month went by and it said, we're sorry to tell you that with all of our searching, we've not been able to locate your item. Have a good day. Remember, fly American, whatever they said. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. I didn't believe them for a minute. You know, and Jesus actually tells a story elsewhere. The good shepherd goes after the sheep. Why? He's the owner of the sheep. He's not a hireling. He cares about us because we are his from the get-go. And how does this parable end? It ends with a hanging invitation, and we don't know how the older brother will respond. And how does this relate to being lost or found? It tells us that either as the one who goes away to a far country, we might be found by Christ, or the one who stays close by and yet in joyless, slavish, external obedience has never fully known the love of a rejoicing Father we can be found. And you know what I would say about myself? I have been both. I came to Christ at age 19, definitely living in a far country. 
But you know what happens? We come to Christ, we get discipled. In my, in my particular instance, felt a call to ministry. And I began to see that Jesus' warnings about practicing our righteousness before others pertain especially to me because as one who was a pastor, was I trying to put on outward appearances? So we can be lost. Either any of us can be lost in both ways, living in a far country or not knowing the love of a father right there. Lost and founds are fascinating things. You know, in, in my years as a pastor, the most, most of the things that found, turn up in the lost and found are not very valuable, are they? Well, look at this. I found this child's knit mitten. I found a pair of dollar store reading glasses. I found a pen from First Community Bank of Percasey. And they lay in the basket of lost and found things forever. But what we find in these parables, that as people, we are valued. And if lost, we are valued so much that a compassionate God goes searching to call us into foundness. And you know what foundness is, I think? And it's fascinating that the language of Jesus, he often uses the term lost and found regarding salvation. But it's to enter in the fullness of life in the kingdom of God where there is rejoicing in the closeness of a loving Heavenly Father. I trust no matter where your journey has taken you or where you are today, you can enter into the joy and enter into the rejoicing with God who loves you with an everlasting love. Amen. Turn in your blue hymnal to number 341 as a response to what we've heard. Let's, on this one, let's have the men sing the, on the verses, let's have the men sing the text and the ladies sing, Now I'm Coming Home. Everybody sing the refrain together. The men will sing the verses and the ladies the, Now I'm Coming Home. <laughs> I've wandered far away from God Now I'm coming home The paths of sin too long I've tried Lord, I'm coming home Coming
If you'll stand for a closing benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.